that we can't be there in person, um, but we're still very pleased to be part of this discussion on an archaeology of global medieval life. Uh, look forward to the discussion that will come out of it. And I'm speaking today on behalf of myself and my colleague, Professor Shadrick Chirikuri, um, and we'll draw on some of our research in Southern Africa to discuss Southern Africa within the context of the global medieval world. So just some background, um, Southern Africa obviously has a very long, varied and rich archaeological record and we are speaking um, today about the more recent past and the period associated with the global medieval middle ages um, and particularly uh, the period from uh, 800, 700, 800 AD onwards um, where we see really clear evidence in the archaeological record of large settlements um, of communities in the region that were um, networked to each other and to other parts of the African continent um, they, through the exchange of copper, salt, um, agricultural produce, uh, many other ivory, um, and also uh, to the wider Indian Ocean world, um, we see evidence of trade networks um, that linked Southern Africa to other parts of the Indian Ocean um, from as early as 700 AD. Um, and this material evidence is in the form um, predominantly in the early stages uh, in the form of glass beads that were manufactured in Asia and the Middle East and other regions. Um, yeah, and so from the late first millennium, early second millennium AD, we also see the development of um, complex um, urban uh, and political formations in the region. Perhaps the most well-known is that of Great Zimbabwe. Um, pictured here, uh, very famous for its elaborate dry stone walls which are uh, extremely tall and also for the exotic objects that were found at the site including this jade porcelain, um, jade sorry no, jade teapot from China and um, porcelain and other items. Um, so our talk will really look at some of the opportunities uh, that the framework of the Global Middle Ages provides as well as some of the constraints um, and both opportunities and constraints are, are, are interlinked. So obviously one of the um, main opportunities of, of a, um, or one of the clear opportunities of a framework of global middle ages or global medieval world is that it allows us to explore the flow of um, technologies and ideas and things across the world um, not just within Europe um, but uh, it brings out um, the interconnectedness of the rest of the world um, and of course the Indian Ocean world is one such region that has uh, gained significant attention within this framework um, and as other scholars have um, articulated um, the concept of the global middle ages really brings out the multiple um, globalizations and modernities that characterize um, passes, the past um, and with regards to southern Africa it helps us uh, position or uh, reposition southern Africa within these um, global connections um, so through the archaeologically through the study of objects such as glass beads we can um, link consumers within southern Africa to producers um, in Asia and the Middle East and explore the networks and ties that facilitated the flow of ideas of people and movement across um, the wider Indian Ocean world and to the southern African shores and vice versa um, so this is really uh, important in recognizing uh, the connected nature um, of the world in the past and, um, uh, and the place of Southern Africa within it. Um, another uh, positive um, potential of um, frameworks such as the Global Middle Ages 
is the potential for looking at um, and comparing uh, social formations across the world. And this is uh, beyond a Charlian concept of state and civilization. Um, we can really begin to interrogate what were drivers of social change and innovations and connectedness in different parts of the world um, and how are these similar and different. Um, this is a, another picture of Great Zimbabwe and uh, as I mentioned it's a very large site with uh, extremely um, elaborately built stone, dry stone walls and so it's monumental architecture and has given it a lot of attention and we can um, compare, it has been compared to sites, um, for example, the stone, um, stone towns, um, the city, uh, city states in the East African coastline, um, as well as uh, places much further afield. And perhaps, um, more importantly, we can compare the experiences um, of different people within the global media ages and how they um, define themselves and how they experience the world um, and bring these people into dialogue with each other um, to get a more holistic picture of how, um, or an interesting picture of how, of how um, the world was in this period. And, um, for example, uh, these are glass beads um, that were made and traded across the Indian Ocean Rim and uh, of, uh, the European continent and used by very um, distinct communities um, uh, across the world. And so one of our avenues of research in Southern Africa has been to look um, beyond uh, merely using these items as descriptors of trade or um, their delineation as items of um, prestige to think about how they were used by communities in the region to create identities or perhaps to articulate personhood in these contexts. Um, this is an image of them and how they, uh, from the site of K2 and Mapungubwe, looking, and, and as you can see, uh, glass was strung, uh, was remelted into new forms and strung alongside other beads and shells. Um, and we've argued that it was um, given new meaning in these contexts and to, uh, particularly within the burials of these sites, to articulate um, personhood. And so there is great potential to explore these questions comparatively across the world. Another uh, um, a strong um, positive of, of, of these uh, frameworks is um, the potential for multi-scalar analyses of um, global processes and um, change on different scales, um, looking at micro to macro and back uh, recursively. Um, so, for example, um, some of our colleagues have been working on looking at uh, settlements and the way that gold was mined in the Southern African region. Gold was um, potentially the main export into the Indian Ocean world during the global Middle Ages. And um, it was mined um, on a small scale seasonally um, by uh, crafting uh, producers who were also um, integrated mining into a diverse economy that included cattle keeping and agriculture. So there wasn't a large scale production of gold and it was traded um, uh, in very different ways. Um, often through networks of exchange and not um, directly to the coast. Um, so we can think about how gold was produced in this region um, and how what the impact of, of these production systems may have had on the trade of gold at the coastline and also um, potentially the consumption of gold in other parts of the world. And of course, um, all of these uh, opportunities are closely linked with constraints, um, some of which I'm sure are very clear. Um, this is a map, um, uh, and it, very similar maps exist for this time period, uh, depicting Southern Africa within um, the Indian Ocean world or the um, 
Eurasian and African world systems uh, within the second millennium. And as you can see, um, Southern Africa is a periphery within this world system. Um, so one of the potential constraints is that when putting Southern Africa into uh, a framework of the global Middle Ages, it is often cast as the periphery within um, an, a world system. Um, it's often conceived as the uh, supplier of raw materials such as gold, ivory and animals um, in return for finished goods such as glass beads and porcelain and other items. And um, you can also see that uh, the main sites that are listed are Zimbabwe, Great Mini Great Zimbabwe and, and Mapungubwe, which is another well-known state site. Um, but on a potentially empty landscape. Um, and a link to this is the imposition of models from elsewhere, so um, bringing Southern Africa into dialogue uh, with um, contemporary developments across the world within the global Middle Ages has also meant the imposition of models um, to understand um, societies within this region, um, the most uh, prevalent uh, in regional scholarship is the uh, imposition of the prestige goods model to understand the development of states and of elites um, and political power within the region. Um, and Southern Africa has often conventionally been, um, well, the states in Southern Africa have conventionally been regarded as um, secondary states that developed in relation to a more, um, to the stimulation from the Indian Ocean trade networks. And um, linked to this is also a reliance on evidence that fits stereotypes of the global Middle Ages elsewhere. So the people, um, first of all, the places um, that are studied in, in discussions around situating Southern Africa within the global Middle Ages are the places that um, look like cities and states elsewhere. So Great Zimbabwe does feature significantly, um, whereas the rest of the landscape is um, often depicted as empty, and the people um, that are brought into this discussion are those that were potentially consuming objects similar to those in other parts of the world, so gold um, or imported items such as glass beads. So what is the way forward? Um, so we suggest that firstly we need to understand uh, Southern Africa in the global Middle Ages on its own terms. Um, so we need to understand um, what uh, what drove social developments and changes and uh, what what the makeup of society was like um, using the evidence at hand um, more critically. Um, so for example, research at uh, places like Great Zimbabwe um, uh, uh, has uh, continuing to show that things, um, objects from the Indian Ocean, um, although they existed there, were potentially not what um, underscored uh, political power of elites um, or that may have um, formed part of the... Um, uh, um, and, and that other, other things um, such as um, cattle and agriculture uh, as well as other forms of power may have been... may have underscored... Um, the economies, uh, the political economies of these societies. Um, so we need to understand why these places developed and to understand the people and the political processes on their own terms. And then linked to that is marginal spaces and invisible people. Um, we need to, we argue that we need to look at um, these peripheries or hinterlands um, to really understand uh, Southern Africa within the global Middle Ages. Um, we know from our ongoing research that um, these state societies were not um, uh, controlling trade or even controlling regional economies. Um, which seem to be fairly decentralized um, and really non-linear in the exchange and uptake of new items from the Indian Ocean as well as from other parts of the continent. 
as well as new information um, and innovations that seem to be coming from peripheries to cause, if you want to use that term. Um, so we need to focus on these spaces to understand really what is happening on the landscape and to really characterize um, or to explore um, who Southern African, what made up Southern African communities within um, the global Middle Ages. And finally, um, we can do this also through recentering Southern Africa. Um, so thinking about Southern Africa as the center and um, also thinking um, not just about the coast and the interior or global in the terms of Indian Ocean, um, but also thinking um, about intra-African uh, networks of exchange um, and also connections within the continent um, that um, may also be equally important in understanding societies in this time period. Thank you very much.